I left for Liberia on a Monday night, 10 days before Christmas. And I departed Liberia this last Monday night, intent on telling my two daughters that her father was not on a three-month moondoggle, <laughs> or having a midlife crisis, as my wife would tell her friends. <laughs> my beautiful spouse and the mother of my three children, our three children, was never on Facebook. She's on Instagram just recently. I would receive short messages from her. When I would be posting what I thought was an appropriate and interesting picture of, you know, when I had time during my work. And she would say, how's your vacation? <laughs> but it wasn't a vacation. I think I worked every day except for Christmas. Uh, near the end, we got a couple of days off on the weekend. Um, it was a great experience. So whether it was a picture of a sunrise over a dusty road, or a sea turtle laying her eggs under the moonlit sand on the West African beach, the real hard work was actually taking the power of social media and communications and putting that into the hands of an army of mobilizers, folks that were doing community outreach as part of the Ebola response. But that's not the important part. The important part was how could we use this technology in the communities where we needed to send people um, and get them information that was valuable for promoting behavior change. So I, I read a job description that included the goal of getting hundreds of people, many of whom never used a smartphone, a digital tablet, or touchscreen before, to incorporate social messaging into their community outreach roles. And what if those roles were critically important to promote positive behavior change during a public health crisis? So I read this with interest and decided to take up the challenge. I led something that has never been done before, but I did it with a team of experts, an international NGO named Mercy Corps, with funding from USAID. It was an expedition. It was part exploration, part experimentation, a journey without maps. But we were surprised with the results. The program is called the Ebola Community Action Platform, and it was an ambitious and still ongoing innovative social mobilization program for the emergency response in West Africa, focused on Liberia, funded by USAID, support from NEPO, and material support from the Paul Allen Foundation. 1,100 smartphones, devices that were put into the hands of the people that were out there in the communities. What is social mobilization? Well, it's a fancy word for outreach or activism. Um, we, had a, we had this army about 900 trained individuals that received the approved messages with help from CDC, WHO, under the guidance of the Liberia Ministry of Health. Their job was to build awareness of Ebola, the signs and symptoms, who to call for help, dispelling myths and misconceptions about Ebola, reducing stigma for survivors, and promoting that positive behavior change to affect an impact in the communities that were being affected by Ebola. So what, where does it fit? The Ebola response, this is the UN's website, UN MIR, uh, United Nations Mission for the Ebola Emergency Response. And it fits in track four, so that other things that were ongoing with hundreds of people that were doing healthcare work first responders, ambulance drivers, contact tracers. Social mobilization was track four, but a very important part to helping close that door on Ebola uh, in Liberia. The training was a cascade training. We trained uh, all of the mobilizers through a series of training sessions in Listen, Learn, Act. In Listen, Learn, Act, they, they learned how to listen to the community first to understand their concerns their issues, their fears about Ebola, and then for the community to then learn based on that context 
what it is, what Ebola really is, and how to how their community can actually act to change behavior. Something as simple as a, a wash basin, chlorine chlorinated water, outside of every little village, outside of every little house um, or community um, center, can go a long way. You see these all over Liberia now. Um, more important things: how not to touch a dead body, how to call the experts to come in to move a dead body if it has um, succumbed to Ebola. Some, some very important behavior changes. So getting the trained people in to handle the dead, very important, sobering messages to be delivered to communities that were being affected by Ebola and still are. Massive mobilization. Lots and lots of people were being trained in these sessions. So it was a cascade training model. We would train the mobilizers, they would train communicators that would go out in the communities with these messages. And who are they? They're young people, like Stone Ridge students. Kids that are kids still in school, young adults that have recently graduated. Motivated youth and young adults belonging to organizations that can get the word out, that motivate themselves to deliver the information in physical form. Um, we had billboards, we had public service announcements. But most importantly, we had the digital content on the smartphones that they were able to show the community members and get them to understand what Ebola really is. It wasn't a, a mystery worm that was in the ground. It was a virus. Basic things about the virus that could help them understand how to, how to change their behavior to avoid the spread of the trend transmission of the disease. Lots of documents and illustrations, including some videos that would come back from these outreach folks about how to wash the hands in a community where a wash basin may not be available. Let's see a few snapshots of mobilizers, and this is what they sent back on their mobile phones. They were crossing bridges Jordan streams and canoes, bridges that were broken down, no vehicles could cross, so they would get to remote communities like Alice Johnson with Last Mile Health. We would have material like cartoons on the survivor stories that would be given to, um, to people in the communities. These were developed by Johns Hopkins University uh, with, with approval from the CDC and then distributed to the communities. Uh, we had 78 organizations involved with all this work. We had folks with megaphones and smartphones. Which was the better tool? It's actually both. We had survivor stories to reduce that stigma. We had people that would talk about their time in an Ebola treatment unit. That it was not some place that was scary, that they were fed food that they were cared for, and they actually walked out alive. And that went a long way to preventing people, when they were sick, from escaping into the bush or hiding in their homes. No community is too far. We had very, very remote communities that needed to be reached by people who knew how to get there and what, how to speak the language when they were there. Fifteen languages are spoken in Liberia, and those are the official languages. So we had to incorporate different languages into the digital content that we distributed. USAID came out for field visits. There's them crossing in a canoe to a remote community. And the digital outreach included WhatsApp, a very popular social media messaging platform, and, and SMS through a partnership with UNICEF. We used community radio extensively because community radio was the most trusted source of information in these individual counties and districts. So as an example, sound file there. We lose the audio. Let's go back to the audio. Three slides back. One more. 
Say in like yo, yeah, when you're running out of your school business to register, don't forget to wash your hands with soap and water. Don't rub fish on your yeah, because the bad signal is staying here. Please tell your friend that it's the same thing. This message is brought to you by the Ministry of Health with funding from UC through IRS, BSI, and the CICO. Well, that's an example of a public service announcement. Now, many of these were distributed on the phones for uh, each individual community radio station. Sometimes in the local language, we would put this content on the phone so that somebody would be able to replay that content in the communities. It might be outside the reach of a mobile network or even a community radio station. We had data collection. All of the activities that were done out in the field were captured. The activities were captured on the mobile phones and then transmitted back in the connection. Um, to a central database that we kept on behalf of the USAID requirements. Um, what was very interesting was that the power of the mobile device in this setting, in this context, we had many one-on-one -on -one sessions um, to affect the change, but after that one-on-one -on -one session, you might have had a continuing communication channel between somebody in the community and one of the people that we employed. All locals, all understanding what type of communication was required to affect that change. We registered hundreds of people, and my thumbs were very tired. <laughs> um, they, would, they would register with their name and their organization, and then we would put them into groups so that they could communicate with each other. We added partners, um, we have stakeholders, and they could register quite easily and keep abreast of what the activities were. The mobilizers could coordinate with the county health officials on what the activities they were doing and where. And recently there was a big push to make sure that there was a strengthening of activities on the border with the Sierra Bend and Guinea. We were able to distribute that content right within WhatsApp, the approved messages, that's the same content as the billboard. We were able to send them additional audio messages. It's difficult to recognize Ebola because the signs Sudden fever, diarrhea, <laughs> vomiting are shared by other diseases. It's quite difficult for anyone, except a healthcare worker, to say definitively, yes, it is Ebola, or no, it is not Ebola. So if you have sudden fever, diarrhea, or vomiting, and you have been in direct contact with someone who is sick, you should go to the health center, because no matter the cause, you can receive help there. And remember, with the right information and together with our healthcare workers, we can protect ourselves from Ebola. Now that's great, that's standard English, you and I understand that, but that's not the local language, which sounds a little bit like this. You get the idea. So 15 different languages were used to get these messages across, and of course, the most important contact and interaction was the people themselves speaking in the local language. We had folks out in the field that were struggling to get connected to a network, something that you and I feel quite you know, privileged, actually, you should, that you have connectivity all the time, whether it's good or bad. Um, here, they were trying to send the report back, trying to get a little sliver of a signal so that they could send their report back in time. We also had a partnership with UNICEF so that we could send them reminders and quick surveys. Um, they would register using SMS, where they're working, what organization they work with. We could do some quick surveys and give them survey results, which would help us redefine the program. We had content partners here locally, Johns Hopkins University. Um, we had help from NetHope and UNICEF. It was a mission that I would love to say, not like George W. Bush did on the Abraham Lincoln, mission accomplished. Unfortunately, we were at 14 days of zero cases in Liberia. We had one case diagnosed yesterday. So my mission was just to come back. I'm blessed and honored to be part of this program and to leave a capable team continuing this charge and we'll close the door on Ebola in Liberia and eventually in the Guinea and Sierra Leone as well. Here's our
social media sites, in case you want to track what's going on, there's quite a bit of submissions. We have over 4,500 photos coming from the field so far in 12 weeks. And most importantly, I can't say this without a smirk. The most important part of affecting this change was going to community leaders. This is a country and a culture that respects their elders, and that's where the communication starts. It was really interesting to see this firsthand in the communities, is that you would start with the community elders many times, the women's groups that were the ones that were taking care of the sick, or understood that the next village over, all the women that took care of the sick died. So maybe they should listen to the messages. So starting with them was the key to getting some communities really charged up, energized, and acting in the right way um, to affect the change we were looking for.